Hey everybody, welcome to Flutter Blog Part 3. In this episode, we'll be doing a couple things. Uh, first, we will be making this toggleable bottom sheet here. So that is just some way that we're going to add um, editing posts down here. And you can see this will edit up here. And we're going to build this whole screen. And it's just a list view with all the different posts here. And then we'll make it so you can actually get into the app. So I'm going to run Flutter Run on the regular project here. And I am going to talk about some changes I made between episodes in this main.dart file. Uh, first, I changed the text theme and I added headline 5 and headline 6. Headline 5 auto applies to the app bar. So if, um, if you have some text in here, your headline 5 will auto apply up there. So that's kind of nice. And headline 6 is just a smaller headline that we'll use for these posts in here. And secondly, I added body text one. You're actually gonna want to change that to body text two. Body text two actually auto applies to any text that is not part of something that is significant to the scaffold. So if you just have a text that is somewhere floating in the app, the app will actually have that text be auto styled by body text two. So if you're ever building an app, just make sure you fill out body text two. And that one's really important. So what we're going to do is we're going to create the actual login function. You have this login folder right here in features. You go into domain, new file. I'm going to see why I called it here. I called it login.dart. And if this ever happens to you and you're running on iOS, just make sure to type flutter clean and flutter run. Uh, this and in Linux, if you don't know, runs two commands back to back. So if we do that, it'll just do both those commands back to back. So what is going to happen when we hit the login button on our app? We actually want to take that response that we coded in the last episode. So in that login page, you'll see that we coded this response right here. And we actually have this response variable. So we can actually write response response is equal to await that response. And here in the last episode, we left some comments saying we're going to handle the response object. And we're definitely going to go ahead and do that right now. So we want to write a void login function that's going to take a response variable login response. I'm going to import that from DO. And now we're going to make that re re login response readable as a JSON. Uh, if in Flutter and in Dart, a JSON object is a map that is just a string and dynamic. So now we're going to do login response as JSON equals that login response. Now we're going to go into our first ever cast in Dart here. How you cast in Dart, there are different ways to do it, but the one that I prefer the most and the most readable is the as keyword. And this should actually not be Dart, this should be data, sorry. And here we have that right there. Now we're going to do final. Make sure to do final for all of the variables that you aren't changing. Uh, if you're using the linter like I set up in the first episode, then it will tell you to add final here and just make it a habit because it'll definitely increase your app's performance. Final user equals user, user dot. Now we actually don't have this uh, this constructor yet, but we're going to add it in a little bit. It's going to be the from JSON constructor, and it's actually going to be super easy to add because it's going to be super easy to add because we're going to actually use a package that does it for us. And we're also going to want to set that refresh token externally, and we're going to make that one a static variable because we actually don't need an instance of the user to access that secure storage. And finally, we're going to be setting up this last thing that allows us to push new routes from anywhere in the, in the, in the app. What I mean by that is normally you do, let me finish out this line and then I will show you what I mean by that. So here we go. We want to import our router here. 
normally we need to do router dot of context dot push replacement named and then type in that name of the replacement but if you see here we actually don't have a context variable and we can't actually grab the router or sorry it would say a navigator see we actually don't have the context variable in this request and we don't want to be passing that context variable around too much uh, the context variable is super powerful but we don't want to be passing it around because it just adds a little layer of difficulty because for the login function if we want to call it from elsewhere we would need to pass it a context variable and that means it needs to be tied to the UI if you don't know the context variable is super tied to that widget tree that we can paint by hitting T and so if we have a function that shouldn't be tied to the UI then we probably don't want to be passing it context we're gonna also make one change in that HTTP client uh, that is in the that is in the lib standard lib HTTP client so we're still making only keyless requests but we're going to make a different change to this basic do error handler function it's going to take a, a new parameter that's going to be a map of int string if you don't know what map is in dart it is a um, a key value pair so it's just going to be like a dict in python or a hash map in in java or some key value pair data structure and we're going to actually have that be extra errors here. And we're going to get an error in our login page because now we added a parameter and we actually don't have that ready. So what this parameter is going to do is we're going to have the failure check if it is one of the three basic failures. And instead of returning a default failure here, we actually want to try to see if it's one of these failures. So the way that this map in string is going to go is we're going to have at param e is a do error and so that is just a pretty self-explanatory parameter at param extra error whenever you have a parameter that really isn't very self-explanatory I really like to help and add the Java doc here or some sort of documentation here so that we actually can see what the parameters are without really having to look at the code and understand what it is so that if somebody else was reading our code, it would be super readable. Map with key being the error code. And I always like to use 404 for error, co error code because that is definitely the most recognizable error code. And extra being the failure message. So now, whenever we go back in our code, we can always look up here and we know exactly what these parameters do. And we will say that at returns, failure, always returns a failure with a readable message. And so now we have a good documentation here that just shows us that when we use this function, we can pass in a DO error and some extra errors, and it will always return a good error that the user can read. So now instead of returning a blank unresolved error, or failure, sorry, we can actually make a failure f equals failure with the message being unknown error. And we actually don't want to return that in in most cases we won't be returning it but in the end case if we deploy our app and we still have an error that we don't resolve we can actually have that error be unresolved so that if we ever make an update to the app and try to catch that error we can easily implement that extra errors dot for each and so this is how you do a for each in flutter there is another way to do it, but I like to do it this way because it just feels a lot better than having an extra function. 
So that is going to be key value. So the way the dot for each syntax works on a map is that's the key and that's the value. So in this case, the key is an int and the value is a string. So we want to do code and error. So now we can check if the code is equal to the response dot status code. So say we pass in I'll show you when we call that function how to do it a little bit better, but if we pass in 404 user not found as the message, then we can it will iterate through all these different things that we added into the extra errors, and it will say, is the error code equal to whatever we passed in here? If it is, then we can set their status code, or we can set the failure response we're returning to that message. If code is equal to e.response.status code, then we can have the failure f is equal to failure. We're actually going to just overwrite the entire failure. Message is equal to the error. And the resolve equal to true. And now we actually just want to return that from outside. So that way, if it goes through all of these error codes and it doesn't trigger it, then we just return this message right here. And if it goes through all those error codes and it does find one, it will just go return that message. We cannot do return f here because it is not it is expecting not a return type here. And this is just an anonymous function, so it will return it into nothing. And so it won't return from this function. Uh, don't worry about that if you don't understand it. It's just that this is just a little bit more complicated of a data structure than just a regular function. So we actually can't do that there. Now in the login page, instead of having this big long switch case, it can actually be a lot easier now. And we can do E comma 404 email not found. And I will like to bring up that a commenter in the last episode brought up the fact that maybe it's not the best security to have uh, email not found and wrong password be separate errors. Um, in a lot of apps, that's kind of a security flaw where when I can just go in here and type in random emails and if it says not found, not found, not found, and then all of a sudden I find an email that says wrong password, I know I can try to brute force or hack into that email. So if you're writing a real application, it might be worth it to actually combine these into two or return the same message for both. Case 401, wrong password. I'm actually going to leave it right now just so I could demonstrate this switch case here. And in the case default, we're gonna actually leave that default blank. And so now we can actually delete this whole block here. Because now what happens is we are always gonna have failure F be that er have a error message that is correct. So now we just want message is equal to f dot error message. Oh, let's actually do, if you leave that string error message here. And now let's do f dot message is equal to error message. So now it will just set that error message and pass it in here. And that should be done here. So in this screen, this is how you do that with set state. And you can see it's a little bit messy because we actually merged our UI with our backend handling and that's not always ideal. That's actually really not ideal and that's not how you wanna do it. Uh, in a later episode, we'll be talking about block and how to do that without, with block so we can keep our UI completely separate from our code or from our backend code, okay? So now that this works, we should still have that error here. And now we actually want to pass in that response object to the login function. So we want to log in with the response. Let's actually spell response correctly here. And we want to import that login function. Now we can go back here and we can see that we have a bunch of stuff unimplemented right now. So we want to go to that user object and we're going to make a lot of changes in that user object. 
it is in our standard lib models user. We can actually add a couple things here to the sign out method so that we really clear out that user's data. But this is a user object and it actually is impossible to um, persist this data across sessions right now. So when we have a user object, if we don't save that in the memory anywhere, it actually will never save over time. So we're gonna start setting up that framework for being able to be saved over time. So we're gonna use this package called JSON serializable. We're gonna to have to import this package here. And uh, real quick, I'm using this field rename is a field rename.snake. This is just meaning that the API is going to give us the variables in snake case. So instead of being, instead of the API giving us directly the name API key in API key, it will actually give us it like this. And that just means snake case. This is called snake case versus this being, I believe it's called camel case like that. I'm going to save that here. And so this JSON serializable package just adds some ability to go to JSON and from JSON. So what it means is when we actually trigger that response on the back end, it's going to send us that user in a JSON with an API key, an email, an ID, and a refresh token. And so to actually create that user object from all that stuff, we can use this uh, syntax right here. And this will just be really easy and a really quick way to go to and from a JSON to be able to send this object if we needed to and to be able to decode this object from a JSON. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a default function here to create a new default constructor with just by setting this.api key, this.email, and this.id. And so what this means is in Dart, constructor bodies automatically, if you leave them without a body, it will automatically just apply these variables to the, the member variables. So that it just makes you save a lot of boilerplate rather than setting API key is equal to this dot API key like you would in a language like Java. It just saves a lot of boilerplate and it makes your code a lot more readable in my opinion. And we're going to actually include two functions here that is required for the JSON serializable to actually trigger. And it's just to JSON and from JSON. And this is actually just some boilerplate. It'll be the same for all classes and all objects. If you wanted to have an object called, say, instead of user, say we want to call it something like um, player, it would just be the same exact function name just with player instead of the word user. So that's that right there. And so you can see that there's actually red underlines here. That's because for this package to actually trigger and make that new file, that code generator file, we're gonna do the same thing we did last episode for the router, but we need to make sure we tell Flutter that we want to use that package. So we want to write user.g.dart up here, and we're going to open up a new shell and we're going to do a control R and we're type in watch and you see this function if you don't know what command R it just searches your bash history so command R is just a really quick and easy way to get that history out you can see I have the function flutter pub get which is the same as we did last time that just make sure that flutter has the same and completely updated pub file and flutter pub run build runner watch same one again that will have the build runner watch all your files and it will generate files as it needs to and delete conflicting outputs this will mean that if we already had a file say for the router we already have the auto generator router.gr.dart if we made a change in router that overrid something like if we renamed the variable in router if we need to log into something else and it would change the name of the route. Instead of 
throwing us an error and saying, hey, we're going to need to delete some code in here, and you didn't give me permission to do that. This delete conflicting outputs will just automatically delete this whole file and just rebuild it from scratch. And honestly, I would say run it in this mode 99% of the time because it just makes it easier to work with and you won't be getting errors like, hey, you changed the name of the route. 99% of the time, that's actually what you want to do and that's your intended behavior to delete that file and rebuild it. So we actually want to make these static here. Uh, that way we don't need an instance of the object to do a set and get on the refresh token. Instead, we just do it with a static access. Okay, and we're back. And you can see here that user.g.dart was automatically generated from the user.dart. Uh, it's really not complicated and it's really not too difficult to hand code that. But if we're creating and adding new things to the user class, we don't want to have to keep retyping the to and from JSON. So just having the serializable here makes it a lot easier and a lot better over time. You definitely will spend a lot less time coding that to and from JSON. Now, you can actually see here that we are creating that user.fromjson, and this user variable right here is loaded with that ID, API key, and email variables, but it's actually not going anywhere. So after this function is complete, and it goes out of scope, and so it destroys that user variable. So we actually want to persist that user variable over time. So we can actually do locator of type user dot set user user. Now we're going to instantly get two errors here. Number one, our locator is not imported. Or get variables over and across different things in the screen. And we want to create that method set user in the user class. So we're going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go to user.dart and we have set user here. The reason why we can't just set that user as set the user we created as this user in the uh, locator is because that locator creates an instance of that object and when it creates the instance of that object it doesn't allow you to override it with a new instance. So this way we can actually just pass the old user, we can pass this user object into the set user method and the old user will override the new user and all that new user's data will become whatever this user variable is. And I actually spelled the user wrong up here, so let's fix that real quick. And that's just what I mean here, so I respelled the word user and it created the proper user variable with uh, the proper names. So we actually need to go into that locator and register into the locator. So now we have that locator and you can see all it's registering right now is our um, is our config class and we actually wanted to register that user object. But as you can see here we're actually getting an error and we actually don't have this user.empty constructor done yet. We're gonna go add that real quick. Right when the app is started up it constructs the user using this constructor right here. This should return a user. And because when the app starts up, we actually don't have a way to get the user object right on startup yet, we need to make that user.empty class, or constructor, sorry. User.empty. And we're actually going to just be an empty constructor here. And that is going to work exactly how we want it to. It's going to create an user object with no variable set in. So this is null, this is null, and this is null, which is what that user.empty should do. I'm going to save our injector. And now, after we reload the screen, let's see what happens when we log in. A, like I said, I made a user with email A, password B, just so it's easy to log in and quick. We hit login and we actually got into the app, but like the navigator tells us, this is one of the reasons why I love this package because it says route name backslash home is not found. So we actually have to create the home screen here. So we're gonna do what we did for login. New folder, we're gonna call it home. And every single one of these features should have a data, even if there's gonna be nothing in them. We still want it there for 
organization's sake. Data, domain, and presentation. Now we want to go into presentation of the home feature. And we want to make a new page called home page. We're going to build that home page real quick. And I'm just going to build this one with you, but when I am going to do the rest of the app, my UI is going to be completely built on my own and I'll just give you the code for that. That's because this isn't a UI design course and it's not how to build a Flutter UI. This is more for the back end, but I'm going to do this one page with you. So I will do that right now. Uh, we're going to actually do a stateless widget. I think it's really important to always make it a stateless widget and when you start to need a state in that widget, then you can convert it to a stateful widget. But I highly recommend you always start with a stateless widget and if you ever need it to be a stateful widget, then just go in here and hit convert to stateful. All right, hit refactor and convert to stateful widget. We're not going to do that because we actually want it to be a stateful widget. Now we're going to do color, colors.red and I will get an error here because I'm not importing material. All right, let's do a different color so we can actually tell the difference here. Colors.green. Now, we need to go into our navigator, our router, and we actually need to add the new route, home page. And it's so simple and so easy to add a route. Home page, home. Import that home page. Wait for our successfully completed. And now when we can just go here, go back, shift R, it'll hot restart your app. We're back in the login screen. We will say A. And if all goes correctly, we should see a completely blank green screen. And there we are. We logged in successfully and we saw a blank green screen. What a lot of our pages in this app is going to need, and not in this app in particular, but when you're building an app, a lot of your pages are going to sh share the same exact design with a app bar, maybe a bottom navigation screen. And instead of having to rebuild that in every single screen that we do, we can actually go ahead and go into our uh, standard lib, UI, new file, and we'll call that main, sorry, main underscore scaffold dot dart. I'm going to create a new stateful widget. Like I said, you should always start with a stateless widget. And when you start to need state, then you go ahead and make it a state full widget. But in this case, I know I'm going to need state already. So when we add a parameter to a stateful widget, we can actually type final before that keyword because that parameter is never going to change. We can do final widget body. And because all our member variables are final, we can write constant here because we actually have a constant a constant object here and it will never change when we update state the only thing we change is the state down here everything up here stays exactly the same no matter what happens throughout the state so whenever we do a um, constructor for a stateful widget we need to go with this syntax always start with the key 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 is something for flutter to know that it is a stateful widget and it knows to where to keep its state in the tree so just make sure to always have that key parameter in there. And then we do this.body, which will clear up our error because now all our final parameters are proper. And we want to use that super constructor for the stateful widget. And we want to go key, colon, key. So that just takes the key and it puts it in the key for that stateful widget. And now we have our main scaffold. And the reason why we have that main scaffold is, like I said before, we're going to be using that same design on many pages and to have that same design on many pages and not have to rebuild it every single time we can actually just use a, uh, a helper widget right here so instead of returning a container the first thing we're going to do is we're going to return a main scaffold type i'm going to import that main scaffold and we're going to do a body with a container 
just color green so we know it's working right now. Comma there. And we need a black screen because in main scaffold, we actually only just return a black container. Unless you want to turn a scaffold with the body being the widget, this will be whenever you type widget in here, you refer to the widget up here. So we're going to refer to that body of the widget up there. We should refresh and we should get our green screen right here, which is exactly what we wanted. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to build out this home page here. The body is going to be simple. It's just going to be a list view. And it's going to have children. And it's going to use a function here, underscore mock posts. Because we don't have real posts yet, we're going to need to mock them. So we're going to use underscore mock posts. And something that I like on my list views is to have a scroll bar. So to do that, we just wrap it with a scroll bar here. And it's still going to throw us an error because we don't have our mock post function. So we actually want to return a list of widgets here. And we're going to have a list of widgets. So mock posts equals a new list of widgets. In Flutter, remember, you never you need that uh, new keyword that is just redundant and arbitrary, so we don't actually need that there. Um, we want to do a for each here. For, and this is going to be a standard for each, like you'll see in Java or many other languages. For in i equals zero. I, think, I believe it's called a C style for each, and Python doesn't have these. We want to add a new post. We don't, we don't have that post set up yet, but we're going to set that up. We're going to do a semicolon here. And we're just going to return that mock posts. And this post is going to take three parameters here. It's going to have a title. And we're going to do a title of a random post here. It's going to be spammed across the whole screen because that's what we decided to do here. We decided to make 10 of them, so there's going to be 10 of these posts with the same everything. Dart is awesome. You can make great apps. And we're just going to have a brief little body, and I'm just going to just say, I love Dart. Dart is really great. I'm going to spam the keyboard a little bit because I need to show you something here, and I need there to be a little bit of text. And finally, we're going to add a final parameter, date. We're going to date time format this later, but it's going to be a string for now. And that's a lot of, that's a big red line because we actually don't have the post class made up yet. New file, we'll do post.dart. And I'm going to copy this in from another file because I don't want to have to go through and build that whole post for you. It's just a simple little post and you will see that later. Going to import this post. That should clear up all our errors. Now we hit refresh. We have a list of all these posts with the same things. Uh, what I tried to do by filling out that body is show you how we did that text overflow. And we actually didn't get there yet. So you can see that our post runs a little bit longer and we have these elliptical overflow. Uh, how we did that here is in the text, we are overflowing with text overflow dot ellipses and max line being three. So after the third line, it's going to overflow with the ellipses. Another thing in here, we're going to add const here, but another thing in here is we are using the theme. Like I said, our theme was going to use headline five, but since it wasn't in something that was mandatory here or something that automatically applied, we actually need to specify that we wanted that theme here. Now, if we ever wanted to change all of these at once, we could do it here, or if we were doing it somewhere else too with the same style, we could just change the headline five in the main.dart, which is really nice. Say I wanted that headline five to have a color of colors.purple. Just refresh the app, and they're all purple now. Okay, now we're ready to work on the scaffold. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna actually have an app bar. The app bar is the thing up here. And we're just going to have the app bar be the default app bar. 
with no actions. And the background color, we will just have it be this color right here. It's just a light gray. Just took it from the hex code. And now we're going to have a leading icon. Uh, the leading icon is the icon that goes in the top left corner rather than in the top right. Icons dot person. And that's, you can see here that we actually have a display of what that icon will look like. And we're going to make that color colors dot gray. And in this series, we're actually not going to use that little button right here. It's just there as a placeholder. Um, you can definitely go ahead and expand that on your own if you want. But in this series, we're not going to use that placeholder. We're going to have a padding widget on the outside. And it's just going to be a 16 padding. Um, this padding is going to go outside one of the actions on the right. What happens with the leading icon is it's right here. And the actions is on the right. And then the title is in the middle. We're going to have a 16 padding around that. And now we're going to have the child. And we're actually going to use a builder. And I'll explain why we have to use this builder in the future. But just know that right now we need to do a builder. I'll explain what a builder is and what it does, but just know that right now we're using the builder. And it's going to actually take a gesture detector because we actually want to detect when it's being clicked on. So we're going to actually do an on tap. Right now, on tap is going to do nothing at all. So it's going to be an empty function body. It's going to do nothing at all. But its child is going to be an icon, icons.create. And the create is a little pencil, and that's going to be our button for writing a post. Um, right now, we'll just do colors.gray, but we're going to change that in the future. And I always like to reload the app very, very often, but since I know what I'm doing here, I don't really have to do that right now. But I will show you oh, for my document, I will show you what that looks like all built out right now. And it is just a gray app bar with this icon on the left and this icon on the right and we want this finally we want in the app bar we want the title to be a text field and what we're going to have this in the end is this text field is going to allow you to search by title and it's going to be fully responsive and it's going to have that autocomplete like feature that you see on google so that's going to be really cool and i'm really excited for that one it's going to have a max line of one because we don't want you to overflow and push this app bar super low. Uh, we just want it to overflow with those ellipses there. And decoration, we're going to do an input decoration. We're going to decorate this uh, in a later episode because I decided that this one's getting a little bit too long. But we're going to have the search icon on the left. Now, when we hit refresh, we should get a search bar right here with the search icon. So now what you can see here is we can click on that search bar and it will glow pink but when we click away we actually can't remove that search bar here. So what we're gonna want to do here is we're gonna go to our scaffold and we're going to refactor wrap with widget. We're gonna wrap it with a gesture detector. Uh, what the gesture detector does is it does exactly as it says. You have a lot of different things here on double tap, on force press end, on horizontal drag down. You have a lot of different ways to trigger this gesture detector. But right now we're just going to do a simple on tap. What on tap is, is when you click on it and lift your, fi let, lift your finger up, it will trigger this on tap function. We actually want to do focus scope dot of context. Like I said, that context variable is super tied to the widget tree. So whenever you're doing dot of context, you know you're doing something in the widget tree. What this does is, I'm not going to go too in depth into this, but just know that this way it just makes it possible to click away. So we're clicking in, and whenever you click anywhere else on the screen, it will trigger that function here. Now we want this, well, currently this does nothing at all, 
but we actually want to make it be able to detect and trigger something. Um, so we're going to go on tap underscore toggle bottom sheet. BS is a bottom sheet. I know it's kind of a funny abbreviation, but that's how we're going to do it there. And it's going to pass in the context. Now we're going to go up here and we're going to add a couple state variables. I'm going to explain exactly what they are as I'm typing them in. Well, first up, we're going to do persistent. Oh, you know, I can't really spell, so I'm going to copy this one in. Persistent bottom sheet controller. This is the controller for the bottom sheet. If you don't know what a bottom sheet is, you will see in just a couple seconds. Uh, I don't know if I can see it in here, but it actually has a lot of different ways and things you can do with that bottom sheet. It has close. You can set that state and rebuild that bottom sheet. You can see if it's closed. And second, we want to do bool bs is open. And we want to start that with false because initially when the page loads, this will actually be false and the bottom sheet will actually be false. Now, we have this toggle bs function and we're going to go ahead and throw that in there. What we're going to want to do is we're going to go to the bottom here and do void underscore toggle bottom sheet. We're going to take a build context context here. And what we're going to see is we're going to check if the bottom sheet is open. If it is open, we're going to do nothing for now. Else, we're going to set the state with the, now let's see if we can get the autocomplete in here. No, we can't. Oh, yes, we can. We're going to set the bottom sheet controller equal to show bottom sheet context context. And with the builder being underscore build bottom sheet. Um, we have controller here. We actually don't have this function built out yet. It has to be a function that returns a widget and takes a build context. But we're not going to worry about that just yet. We're going to add a bottom sheet is open equals to true. We're going to want to toggle that true so that our app knows that that bottom sheet is open. Um, so this show bottom sheet is the function that is already in Dart that is going to show that bottom sheet with this context. So it's going to take, find the nearest scaffold and it's going to try to display a bottom sheet and it's going to use this function right here to tell us what is inside that bottom sheet. And it's going to return a controller for that bottom sheet. So what happens all in one line, it shows that bottom sheet and it sets this bottom sheet controller and it builds that bottom sheet to be whatever we put in this BS into this build bottom sheet function. Here. Um, so we're actually going to do a new file because we have a function here that returns the draft sheet and we actually don't have that created yet. So you can see we cleared up our area here by returning a widget, but we don't have this draft sheet created yet. So to do that, we're going to add a new feature and we'll be filling out all these features later. This is just a UI heavy episode here. New feature folder draft and by draft I mean we're going to draft a post uh, I like to have these features be one line that's just a personal thing it doesn't really have to be like that and it's not really a um, a convention I just like it to be one one word we're going to do a new file and we'll call that draft underscore sheet dot dart I'm going to go into that draft sheet and I'm going to command paste this in here all it does is it just has a, I know you can't really see it by looking at the code, but it is just a, um, a square with rounded corners and it, all it has is a text that just says H. It has a little bit of shadow on it too. We're going to go into the main scaffold and we're going to import this draft sheet. We're going to reload and we're actually going to get an error here. This actually needs to be an anonymous callback. 
And so we're going to refresh that. And now when we tap this, we're going to get our bottom sheet popping up. There's actually no way to push it down now. And when we try to do that, we're actually going to get nothing happening because it's checking if it is open. And if it is open, it does nothing and doesn't trigger this function. Um, we can actually type in if false here. So I can show you what happened if we didn't check and if we just kept reloading here. You would click on it and it would just rebuild that bottom sheet every single time. Same way every single time. And it's just kind of is not the behavior we want. We actually want to fill out this if bottom sheet is open function here. The first thing we want to do is we want to close that control. We want to close that bottom sheet. So that's going to close this right here. Now we want to set state and we want that be as open equal to false. And just to be a little bit safe here, oh sorry, BS is open. Just to be a little bit safe here, we want to make that controller null. This actually probably doesn't matter that much, but I want to do that here just to be safe so that if we ever try to do something else with that controller, it will fail and throw an error because it's already down and it won't uh, confuse us if we do something wrong here. So now when we refresh here, we can click to push it away and click to bring it back up. And we actually want to reflect the fact that we have that bottom sheet up in the UI in this up here. So we want to do in this builder, we want to do if it is open, we will have it be the primary color of the app. And if it is closed, we just want it to be gray. There we go. Refresh there. Now you see it's closed, open, closed, open. And now we actually have something that is pretty cool and pretty nice. The reason why we are using this builder is because the builder will refresh the context. If we didn't have this builder here, we would get an error saying there's no scaffold above this context. So I'm going to show you kind of in depth what the build context does. And I'm going to just add some comments here. So we have our root application, which is just, we'll say root up here. And it has a child. And that's the child right there. And each of these times that we create a new widget, our build context gets refreshed. So say we want child here, we get a new build context, and we have a new build context, and we have a new build context. But what the dot of operator does, so when we have a, um, like I'll, sometimes I'll do navigator dot of context, what it'll do is it will actually look dot of will look up the widget tree and see if there is a navigator up there. So if we had a navigator here and we called the navigator dot of context here, it's going to look up the widget tree and it's going to find the navigator up here. But if we had the navigator here and we tried to do navigator dot of context here, it's going to look up the widget tree and it's going to actually tell us that we never found a navigator above us because the only thing above is just the root. So by adding that builder here, by adding that builder here, we actually add a new child, quote unquote, you know, so that instead of looking up right here, so what this right here does by doing this builder, is in this gesture detector, we're calling this toggle BS with this context here. This context, this um, show bottom sheet function is taking this context and is looking up the widget tree for the scaffold. If we didn't have this builder here though, the, sca the context that is right here would actually be the same context that would be the scaffold. So this would be on the same level as this right here. So this just adds a new layer up the widget tree. If that's confused you, don't worry. I guarantee you'll get it eventually, and if you just keep programming, you'll understand it, but uh, that is just a brief little overview of that right now. The other thing that I want to do is I want to make it so that when you click anywhere else, right now we can click and we can drag here and nothing goes down. We actually want this to go down if we focus somewhere else. 
So we're going to actually just go to that body where that body is. Oh, it's right there. Go under refactor, wrap with the widget. We'll do gesture detector. This is the last thing we're going to do for this episode. Don't worry. No, it's getting long. We're going to go on tap down. And we're actually going to do an anonymous callback, but we're going to use an underscore here. That's because this on tap down passes in a variable. And we actually don't care about that variable. We don't care about that variable here. And we don't even want to use it anywhere. So an underscore just tells Dart that just as soon as we get it, just delete it from the memory. It doesn't really matter. So we're going to do underscore close bottom sheet if necessary. That's going to be a nice little function. And we're going to extract it later on. But right now, we're just going to have it as it is. And all it's going to do is this only going to do the second half of this toggle bottom sheet function. Uh, in my other file, I'm in with BS open, so that's why I keep doing that error there. Now, we refresh, and nothing changes, but we actually added that invisible gesture detector. So when we start dragging, that will go down. The reason why we need to do an on tap down rather than an on, uh, on tap or on click is because on tap will wait for us to click and release. And on a drag, we're actually not releasing for quite a while. And we don't want that to be down the whole, or we don't want that to be up on our whole drag. Okay, so that's all we're having in this episode of Flutter Blog. So as a recap, we built this whole screen here. We added the login. And just as a quick reminder for that login, if we refresh the state, it actually is not persistent throughout a shift dart, it will log us out. So just A, B. We're gonna make it so that in the next episode, um, the actual data is persistent in the memory and not through states. Okay, thank you for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Have a good one, bye.